There is this notion of a sort of separate club. And while it's comprised of an act based not in love, what can you do for me? How can you further me? And when you get nothing, you pack your love and flee. Well, that ain't love. Love is an action. It's a verb, not just a word to abuse and take lightly. Just said to be heard an everyday action and reactions are chances in making love active and not just a word my mama she shows me love it's a kinetic love for I am the product of an act based not in love you see single she she raised me with help from family especially mommy's mommy you showed such love Take lightly, just say it to be heard. Oh, and everyday actions and reactions, those are chances in making this thing ever so active. And not just a
consider your approach. Yeah, yeah. Consider how you, how we love. Many of you have asked me about my trip, and I have so much to tell you. It'll take all year to get it told. But let me tell you about Israel just a little bit. Um, you know, the scriptures indicate to us how much rabbis like to argue. There's always, Jesus is always having a fight with somebody in the scripture. That's a Jewish person. Now, we could think that's polemic, but Jesus is always going to verbal, verbal blows with the Pharisees, or he's having it out with the scribes and the lawyers. And he's arguing with Nicodemus about what it means to be a part of the reign of God. you got to be born again. And you think to yourself, well, what's that about? In fact, rabbis are the most argumentative people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> I'm in Israel, and you're arguing. That's all you do. You argue. You, you sit with the really smart rabbis, and you watch them argue. And then they bring out this big, fat book that's bigger than our pew Bible called the Talmud, and you discover that inside that is just a bunch of rabbis arguing. They, they start with the Hebrew scriptures, and they, and they debate it, and they argue about that. Then they wrote those down on ancient papyri. Isn't that a good word? And then somebody read that, and then they argued about that, and they wrote the argument down again about the, a big old thick book of centuries of rabbis fighting it out. What's that? Why? Good question, Dean. Because there's 613 laws. 613 laws. Who can remember them? Uh, who, and believe me, the rabbis are doing this. Who can remember, the, who can remember these laws? And, and who understands these laws? So they have a whole canon of stuff to help you to understand what the law is all about. That's what's going on in the text this morning. Jesus has been out and about preaching a new gospel, a new word from God, teaching new teachings. And the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the other rabbis just want to argue with them. So right before the text that John read today, they've been arguing about the resurrection. And evidently, Jesus gives such a good answer that this one scribe kind of says, I, I like that. I like that. So he goes closer and asks Jesus another question. Why don't you tell me what the greatest commandment is? Again, when you've got 613 laws, you want someone to give you the quick, easy, cliff note version of how to get into the kingdom of God, okay? So Jesus says, here's the answer. Now, before I tell you what Jesus said, a, a rabbi writing just before him called Hillel the Elder, Hillel the Elder, he got the same question, and Hillel said this, never do anything to your enemy that you would hate having done to you. Never do anything to your enemy that you would hate having done to you. That is the Torah in a nutshell. Go and do it. That's a good little cliff note, isn't it? So Jesus gets the same kind of question from this particular scribe. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell the story in their Gospels. Sometimes it's a rich young ruler, but in this Mark's remembrance, it's a scribe. What is the greatest commandment? Of all. Jesus, who's a rabbi, calls them back to the basics. He says, Shema O Israel, in Hebrew, hear O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole strength. And Jesus added in might. So it's mind, might, heart, and soul. You'll love God with all of that. And then you love your neighbor as yourself. The scribe, preaching a sermon on Jesus, no, adding into the argument, says, sure, I think that's right. And the scribe says, this commandment that you've given is greater than any burnt offerings, or greater than any sacrifice, greater than anything you do is this commandment to love. 
God with everything, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, yes, you're right, and you are now close to the kingdom of God. Love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is saying this sums up the 613 laws. Jesus is saying if you need a quick cheat note that you can put in your breast pocket or put in your iPhone or something you can text to your friend or tweet, this is what it is. Love me with all you've got and love your neighbor like you love yourself. Easier said than done. Jesus isn't saying love God with all you have because it's a duty or responsibility or if you don't do it, you're going to get stomped on or stepped on or your house might catch on fire or there might be a superstorm that comes your way. Jesus is reminding the people of Israel and thus today, us today, that you love God with everything you have because you've never been loved like this before. You've never known a love like this. That's the covenant between God and God's people. God is a super bad lover. Dion and Lisa are celebrating their anniversary today. Happy anniversary. I know they're mad for each other. You can see it in their eyes. That love doesn't get close to the way God loves us. God loves us like nobody else can. God knows that we are foul-mouthed. God knows that we are um, stanky, cranky. God knows that we are sometimes little and bitter. God knows that we are petty and small. God knows that we are jealous of each other. God knows that we send each other the bad, evil eye behind each other's backs. God knows that sometimes we don't take enough showers, and God still loves our dirty drawers. God loves us like we cannot wrap our minds around. God loved us stubborn people who, when God set them free, had the nerve to go out in the wilderness and make a golden calf and worship it. God loves a people who are so unfaithful that even today we're always making little gods before us. Our jobs, our money, our sense of self-righteousness, even our leftist progressive politics, amen, Amen. can be our God, and God just keeps on loving. God is like the energizer bunny. You can't turn God's love off. That's why We love God back. It's the grateful response to this free gift. We can't earn it. We can't procure it. We can't engineer it. We can't create it. We can't generate it. We can't cause it. We can't buy it. But we can't deny it. God loves you so much. When I was a little girl and I had my first boyfriend, I wasn't that little. I was geeky, 17. Let's just go there. Um, I had my first boyfriend, and oh my God, I loved this guy so much. He played trumpet. He was cute. He had nice lips. My mom said to me, I hope for you that you will love somebody who loves you more than you love them. That's how God's love is. We will never get it. Never love God as much as God loves. But God's love pours out and draws us in. Are you with me? That's what the love of God thing is about. And Jesus says, no matter what you think is important, this is what's important. Karl Barth says the only true test of true Christian life is where love is. Howard Thurman says wherever love is. Jews, Christian, Buddhists, Muslims, atheists, wherever love is, that's where God is. 
And John says it this way in his letter, those who live in love live in God and God lives in them. That's God's love. Now, the harder thing about this, I think, is this thing about loving your neighbor as yourself. It's so hard that most of the Reformed theologians don't even want to touch it. Like, you can't find a commentary where they're talking about loving yourself. Why? We're worms. And, and there's something problematic if you are a worm and you love yourself. Okay, we're not worms. <laughs> but somehow it gets into the literature, it gets into the early church literature that to love ourselves is to be prideful or haughty, and then that's a sin and we shouldn't do it. But Jesus says, love your neighbor in the same way as you love yourself. It's an equation. It's an equal sign. It's not about as much of. It's as in the same way. So how do you love you? Well, here's a problem. Because I think, actually, the biggest problem facing us as humankind right now is, in fact, we do love our neighbors the way we love ourselves. And we don't love nothing about us enough to love anybody. Oh, we say we do. We stand in the mirror and we groom ourselves and we give ourselves affirmations, you know. Today will be a great day. I, I am a person full of promise and possibility. Um, there, there is no one like me in the world and God is good to me and it will be a prosperous day and amen and yeah. But the inner text, the underneath that text, is the crap that God said to us by, a, by an angry parent. You ain't squat. You can't do that. I don't believe in you. I know God didn't give me you to raise. Or a foolish teacher. Maybe you're good at sports, but, you know, if we're not expecting you to do math, let's put you in the tech school. Or somebody on the playground, a, a peer, someone we needed to love us and affirm us, someone we confided in, and instead they dissed us, and it went way down deep in our soul. So the message, the fake message is, I'm good. But the true thing that's running around in our brain is there's no way that I'm worthy. I'm just too stupid, I'm just too gay, I'm just too black, I'm just too fat, I don't speak English well enough, I'm just not the one. And out of our emptiness, at the place where we are broken, at the fissure that's inside of us, has grown a callus that makes us unable to love ourselves or to love anybody else. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And so we make war with each other. We make enemies out of each other. We draw lines in the sand and we say, if you come over here, I'm going to simply blow you away. And often the enemy is our own self. But we project it out there and we create a reason to be mad. When John and I were in Israel, we met a man named Neil. We met a man named Neil, <coughs> who was a Bedouin. That's Joseph's people, you know, wandering shepherds. And he had a shop, and we were walking through the old city, and he was doing what they do, which, but the rabbis argue when the shopkeepers come out, okay? That's, that's how it goes. Come on, come on in, come on in. Come on in, let me show you what, what I've got to sell. And we thought, we're not trying to shop today. He's like, I've got water for you. So he gives us a cup of water, and then he says, let me show you something. And he takes us up the back stairs. He takes us up the back stairs to the roof over the old city. Oh, my goodness. This is not the tourist view. This is crosses and minarets and stars of David and old cobblestone streets. And Jesus walked here, and you're like, wow. It's a view of all of these people who call the place holy and they hate each other. Even as they love the God who gave them the land and the town. Do you feel me? 
These are the people who God loves, who they love God, but they can't stand each other, and they've erected walls around the city, and they've erected fences with barbed wire and razor wire, and you can't get in, and you have to go by the checkpoints, and you have to take hours because you're not a Jew or you're not a... And oh, how easy it is to judge those people. What is wrong with those people? What is wrong with those people? How can they not love each other? Well, we're not there, but we make our own walls. We make our own big stone concrete walls around each other, keeping each other away. We erect fences with barbed wire. You are not me. You are not like me. I don't love you. I can't stand you. And sometimes it's just simply, I can't stand myself. To quote a great singer, that ain't love. Love is an action, a word. Excuse me, love is an action, not just a word to be heard. Love is patience and kindness and gentleness and grace. And I don't think we can do it for each other until we learn to do it for ourselves. Is there something in you that you need to forgive about you? Is there something that you need to let go of that traps you, sticks you, keeps you from moving toward the other, that keeps the wall up, that keeps the razor wire up, that keeps the checkpoints? You can't come by here unless you get to be like me. Sometimes we're so afraid of the order that's in our head about the way life can be, should be, must be, to keep us safe, that we can't move. John tells me a story of going out to feed um, uh, butterfly, take butterfly out. And there were some young adults, some young adults your age, out in the park, homeless young adults, grungy, clearly needing a bath. And John offered them sandwiches, and they were so grateful. Thank you so much, thank you so much, thank you so much for the food. And another young woman, slightly older, watching John distribute the sandwiches says, why did you do that? Why did you feed them? Don't you think they should be working? Shouldn't, shouldn't they be earning their way? And John said, he said something like, you know the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 on the mountaintop? Yes. Yes, I know that, she says. Do you think Jesus asked them anything about their credentials? Did Jesus vet them before he fed them? No, he just loved them. And he just gave them food. Yesterday, our missionaries were in um, Far Rockaway, and they um, saw, among other terrible sights, a boarded-up bank. Wood on the windows, but a cardboard sign that says, food. And a line of people waiting for the barbecue, waiting for the love, waiting to be seen and known, not vetted, but seen and known and loved. Now, you guys know my favorite sermon to preach is justice. But I am really not talking about that today. I'm really asking us as a congregation to think about the unlove in our life. Where's the unlove in your life? I have a, a story that I was going to disguise because my mom will listen to this uh, later. Hi, mom. Uh, but, but I want to tell the truth on me, uh, even though it's a little embarrassing. I have a half-brother whose name is Richard. He's my dad's kid, uh, just a, 18 months older than I am. Do the math and imagine the story. Um, Richard was a problematic kid. His mom abandoned him, put him on a train, and sent him to my grandmother's house. And he never knew her. And that put a hole in his soul so deep and so dark and so painful that he actually was just a pain. Hard 
to love, big brother. Mean, ingeniously mean, big brother. Crafty. And honestly, I just, I put him out of my life. I just put him out of my life. I couldn't take it, I couldn't do it, I couldn't bear with it. I went to seminary, just who knew Trish, graduated 20 years ago, got ordained 20 years ago, and um, sometime in seminary, it felt like a, like a water drop of God's love was beginning to work on the hardness. It was a water drop at first, and then pretty soon it turned into a stream of water, and the, and the stream of water began to wash away the rocky, evil, cranky stuff I was stirring in my soul. Maybe even for good reasons. Like, he really, really hurt me. Like, really, really, really hurt me. But how was I going to be a preacher with the hard rock of anger at my brother in my heart? How was I going to talk to you about love while I was hating on Richard? It took years. But there was a moment in time when the peace was there, and I don't, didn't even remember what the poison felt like anymore. I just didn't even remember it. And now, you know, we're not kicking it. We're not going on vacation together. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> but I love him. I'm so proud of him. He was an addict, and he's in recovery. He, he's lovely to us. He sends birthday cards to my niece and nephew. He sends them a dollar for every good grade. He's in the family, caring about the family. He loves my mother. He's engaged with her cancer. He's lovely. And if I didn't let that go, I wouldn't know that. More importantly, if I didn't let that go, who would I be? Where would be my authenticity? Where would be my faith? Where would be me? Just a mass of unforgiveness. That ain't love, to quote a great singer. Where is your unlove, metal family? I say to you, out of love, not judgment, out of hope, not despair, that the power of God within us is so huge, we can't afford to not let it flow from us because it's dammed up with unlove. Love. God with everything you have and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let go of the self unlove and love will flow. Oh man, it's not easy. But it's right. <laughs>